Good evening and welcome to District Reports. I'm Susan Hamblin and I will be your host and moderator for this evening's show, talking with two downtown and north, far, no, what is it called? Near West, that's the term I'm looking for. So we have District uh, 4, Alderperson Mike Favere, welcome to you. Thank you. And District 5, Shiva Badar Siloff. Thank you. And interestingly enough, you actually are four and five and you're next to each other. We usually have like 19 and nine and they're next, yeah. So it makes no reason, rhyme or reason as to what the numbers mean, but you're both in the downtown-ish area. So on the, we have a new format um, this year of trying to have two alders that have adjoining districts talk about their districts. So it's called district reports for a reason. And um, so that's what we're going to do tonight, talk about your districts and we'll end with some council business that's going to follow the show right after this. So on the screen for those who are watching, they see district four and district five. So they have some idea of the key elements of your districts and um, district four I think is Monona Terrace in my head and um, District 5, Camp Randall, and the University Park, Eagle Heights, that area, right? And um, some of the university housing that down there. So um, to start with, what are the demographics of each of your areas? And we can start talking about the similarities or differences in that respect. Thanks for having us tonight. The 4th Aldermanic District, I would argue, is probably the most visible of the city's 20 districts in that it represents the core downtown area. So it's the state capital and the neighborhoods around the state capital. The demographics actually have been somewhat to my advantage in the over two decades I've represented that I district. 23 years so far. Yes, 23 <laughs> years to be fairly, <laughs> fairly exact, yeah. Uh, in that when I was first elected, the district was much more predominantly made up of undergraduates. And over the last couple of decades, there has been an explosion of owner-occupied housing downtown, namely in the form of condominiums that have led to uh, an increase in the in the median age of the district. Uh, I don't know what you know the last census figures were in terms of uh, the median age and those census so tracks. But the older? yes. So again, when I was first elected, it was predominantly undergrads at the University of Wisconsin that lived in that area, and it has increasingly become. Uh, um, you know, a trend more in, in the older demographic. For example, tons of empty nesters mm -hmm. are choosing to live downtown. You know, folks that really have the opportunity to, to choose where they live anywhere in the community, indeed in the country, and they're choosing to at least have one of their homes in downtown Madison. But it's interesting with the explosion of Epic systems in the last few years, the trend now I think is more going in the direction of millennials and those in their 20s, uh, early 30s sort of thing. So many of the new multifamily uh, residential buildings that have been constructed in the last five years or so have been geared toward uh, millennials and, and, and many of them as I've come to, to meet uh, uh, over the years uh, are Epic employees or, or um, uh, Epic related uh, private employers. Yes. Yeah. And that's what surprised me when you said the median age went up because I see more of the millennials moving into this area, but I guess maybe in the next census we'll find out yeah. if it balances. Again, my benchmark is when I started it, the first time I ran in 1995, right? right. Yeah. So, so it's uh, real interesting. Yes. Right. You're in District, District 5. I'm in District 5, so in District 5 is the near west side of Madison, so Camp Randall West, um, almost to Hilldale, and then it goes to the lake and um, to the Commonwealth Bike Path. Um, so really the core of the near west side of Madison, and so the demographics I would divide it maybe in three kind of categories. It's mostly single family residential area, including University Heights, which is one of our um, incredible historic districts in the city of Madison. And then we have a demographic that is undergrad students that live in, I would say, not kind of the um, uh, really high rises that we've seen um, east of my district and downtown, but really more of the three to four story or even like the more traditional kind of duplexes, um, 
uh, four plexes for students um, around the University Avenue corridor. And then if you go to Eagle Heights and University Houses, which are part of my district, then it's really the, the university housing for our grad students. So again, kind of apartment buildings, um, uh, mostly under, under uh, for graduate students. And from a race and ethnicity perspective, I will also say that um, the diversity of my district for um, uh, rates of ethnicity is really mostly uh, focused on university houses and Eagle Heights, and the majority of the rest of the district is predominantly um, white. Right. And with most cities, um, high density versus mm -hmm. as you move out further west, Correct. very low density. All right, um, your industry, your, your job generator, shall we say, Obviously, the state of Wisconsin and the state of Wisconsin well, with the university. Health sciences. Yes, it's yes. really healthcare. Yeah, yours is. <laughs> I would say. So go ahead. Why don't we start with you? So Sheila. I mean, my my district has what we would call now the West Campus area, which has developed tremendously over the past, I would say, you know, 15 years, where we've seen really a growth in that part of of the campus that has a, all the health sciences, School of Nursing, School of Pharmacy. Um, a couple of new research buildings that we have, and then, of course, um, UW Hospital, uh, where I happen to also work in my day job, but it's, um, it's an, uh, you know, certainly a very big uh, employment um, destination for, um, for my district. Um, so I would say that is really kind of the core. And, of course, the university. I mean, um, engineering and kind of the west side of the campus um, is um, part of my my district and so. there has been a lot of growth in that yes, in yes, that area definitely. as well and job generator for you uh, but it's still affiliated with the state of wisconsin yeah although U uw health is a separate, separate entity. entity right it was you correctly identified uh, obviously with the capitol square being the the uh, most identified uh, part of the district it is state government largely uh, although we're seeing more and more state agencies leaving the downtown, for example, to the new development at the former uh, Hill Farms uh, is one example of that where more agencies are leaving the state agencies are leaving the core downtown area and moving elsewhere, uh, largely in the city, though, luckily not not leaving this, the city, although there are a few examples, for example, DNR's forestry uh, section moving up north. Uh, so it's largely state government to be sure. It, the good news is that as some state agencies are leaving the core downtown area, it seems that the private sector is filling that gap, filling that void uh, fairly nicely. Um, so for example, whenever new office buildings are, are being uh, constructed or old ones renovated, it seems like uh, they quickly fill up uh, with private sector uh, employers. The traditional ones around the Capitol Square, of course, are law firms and lobbying firms. Uh, but we're seeing more and more the, the high-tech firms wanting to be downtown. Again, those that are largely populated by millennials that want to be downtown to live, work, and play. Uh, and so the employers are responding to that by having their offices downtown, including some of the aforementioned Epic spinoffs. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that many of these you know, Epic employees obviously are, are located um, largely in Verona, and I say largely because so many of them I've learned are on the road traveling all over North America uh, for their jobs, but, but they choose to live in downtown Madison, uh, again, because that's where they want to, to live and play, even though they're, they're really part of that reverse commute that, mm -hmm. that we see to Verona, to Verona most sweet work days. So most of the buildings that were uh, occupied by state agencies are being turned over by other employers. But the big one was the Lorraine Hotel building, yes. which um, ended up to be residential um, in the end. Yes. My husband had an office overlooking the Capitol for many, many years when he was at Justice. But I recall uh, that, yes. Yeah, the, the Lorraine is clearly one of the many successful yeah, downtown right, condominium right. communities now. We really that, couldn't afford to live there. <laughs> formerly, no, nor could I, Sue. So, uh, but could, but yeah. the Justice Department, as you say, it was, was the State Justice Department was housed there for many, many mm -hmm. years. And then moved, still on the square. Yes, in the yeah. Research Justice Center. Right, uh, right. Um, so, anything else on housing or jobs or anything like that that either one of you wanted to offer? We can go on. Um, well, so, I, you know, go ahead. I, I could just mention that uh, you know the the construction boom, which everyone sees in our community, ha has been a part of downtown for so many years. 
The skyline is, is always seemingly dotted with tower construction cranes. There was a respite, if you will, or a break during the recession, uh, you know, around 2007, 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. uh, but it came back with a tremendous boom after the recession passed. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the fact of the matter is, is there have been hundreds of millions of dollars of investment in the downtown area over the last several years. And much of that is in uh, residential uh, construction. Uh, but the interesting trend that your viewers might not be aware of is that almost all of the new buildings, in fact, I would, I would say every new building uh, that's been built downtown for residential use has been uh, apartments. So one af lasting effect of, the, of the recession. Condos, but correct. So one lasting effect to to of the yeah. recession that you know I experience and those of us that that have the privilege of owning downtown condos uh, experience is the fact that it is a very tight owner occupied market downtown because the supply is just not there because the capital markets, the lending community apparently are not comfortable lending for uh, owner occupied housing these mm. days since the recession as they once were. And so almost all the new buildings that your viewers see uh, are apartments, some geared towards students like the massive Hub and James projects closer is to campus. Your district or just on the Th edge? Those are in the fourth district. They're still in the fourth. The hub okay. and the James. So again, the hub is the one uh, at State and Francis. James is where West Gorham Street becomes University Avenue mm -hmm. at, at North Bassett, right at the curve. Mm -hmm. So you know those are uh, almost a, almost one thousand residents in those buildings. Each of those buildings, uh, but similarly, so there's a boom of of student housing closer to campus. The Canyon effect that city plans have purposely, by the way, encouraged. And, and then uh, what we're seeing though is many people that I've talked to that want to live downtown uh, in a condo, but the market is just so tight, it's very difficult to find an available condo. And we're just, we've just heard a few months ago of the first, although relatively small scale condo proposal downtown, and it's actually right across from the Dane County Courthouse on South Hamilton Street that mm -hmm. I think uh, your viewers will see moving forward. Uh, throughout the rest of the year here. And I think that's also applicable to the rest of the city. Um, it's a very, very tight market. Um, supply is not there and demand is high. Mm -hmm. So I say our empty nesters um, try to move on, <laughs> <laughs> shall we say. So let's talk about some main concerns you have. Um, one, I think, on both sides, and you both serve on the ALRC, mm -hmm. is that correct? correct. A alcohol. Safety and Review Committee um, would be the alcohol sales and consumption, shall we say? Um, if, um, Shiva, do you want to start so with that? So, to be honest with you, from a District Five concern, it is really not high up in the concerns for District Five. We actually, I actually have very few but again, alcohol you're, license you're establishment, but. Yes. That's, but that, I mean, I would actually say, generally speaking, I mean, where there is more is on the Regent Street corridor, kind of, um, you know, all the way to Camp Randall. Um, and then certainly there's been a lot of conversation on Monroe Street, which is Alder Eskridge's district, as, as far as the increase in the number of alcohol license establishment, mostly restaurants, but again, um, kind of the changes in seeing some of what used to be retail become really more restaurant based businesses. Um, that's a broader conversation that's also happening around downtown State Street and all the way to Willie Street. So I think from a, a overall, um, you know, alcohol license establishment, that's been the conversation. This kind of tension between, you know, restaurants, which certainly bring um, uh, certain um, tourism and also people in the neighborhood who really like to have access to, you know, a variety of restaurants um, and uh, places to go to the fact that many of these faces and, and these corridors used to be much more focused on um, retail, small traditional shop, retail, yeah. small shops, and, yeah. and um, the market trends around that, so. Interesting. Well, Mike, then most of the problem is but in your district. Yeah, yeah, that's what I say. <laughs> yeah. there's, a, there's a reason to why I've served on the ALRC for so many years, and it's because I would end up being at the meetings in any event because so much of the agenda uh, involves establishments or proposed establishments in the fourth district. So, um, as has been the case as long as I've been 
around the the fourth district has the majority of alcohol licenses in the city uh, so it is you know our, I think arguably the region's entertainment district the fourth district includes as I've mentioned before the Capitol Square most all of State Street uh, the real focus the last few years has been on the University Avenue corridor uh, the area generally adjacent to campus so generally between okay. I was north, thinking more generally west, between be, north yeah. North Broom Street and North Lake Street. Okay, that area. So it's it's the we, we the city has allowed over the last many many years a very high concentration of uh, liquor license capacity in this area and mostly uh, in the form of taverns. As Shiva correctly identified, much of our conflict and discussion at the ALRC is is restaurant versus tavern and asking establishments the to prove to us that they're a bona fide restaurant, that the restaurant won't morph into a tavern, that sort of thing. So what we've seen over the last many years is this um, spike in, in crime uh, on Friday and Saturday nights in the lower State Street University Avenue corridor that I, that I previously identified, um, to the point that it's been about 10 years now where the city has uh, asked the Madison Police Department to um, concentrate their patrol efforts on weekend nights in that area through something that we call the Downtown Safety Initiative, whereby Madison cops volunteer to work on overtime uh, in, in those those hours. So tell me again just in, the in area a very so again, it's it's about. generally Lower State Street. What I would identify as the five and six hundred blocks okay. of State Street. Okay. Again, between Broom, Gilman, uh, and then on down to roughly Library Mall, Mall North yeah. Lake Street. Right and then over to University Avenue. Uh, so it, it, it's not as if um, um, any particular establishment is to blame. At renewal time, only a few weeks ago, we asked all of the establishments in that area generally to come in and, and chat with the ALRC. Every alcohol license in the state is up for renewal annually each summer. Each yes. summer, and we made the decision early on to summons all of them in to our meeting and the condition that we uh, added to each of those licenses was that they could not allow any new patrons to enter or re-enter their establishments after 1.30 in the morning wow. on Friday and Saturday nights. Now for your viewers that aren't familiar, the state statutory bar time is 2.30 on those nights. Mm -hmm. so, so they're not allowed to uh, so an hour uh, permit anybody closing. an hour right. right before closing. Yeah. Exactly, and we hope that that will make a big difference because many of the problems that we've seen in this area uh, occur, not only of course uh, are limited generally to weekend nights, but are in those later hours around bar time and, and right before bar time right. and that we're I mean, seeing, nothing good happens and, that, no, and that we're, you know, we're seeing more and more people coming downtown. It's also called common sense, yes. Seemingly yeah. you know, looking to cause trouble. And part of the magnet too has been the uh, State Street Campus parking garage. There's been a lot of concerns about activity in that garage over the last few years and that that uh, is an incident, incidents of crime are located in that area. So the parking utility has been a partner with the police to try to uh, mitigate the issues in their garage. It's, it's the one adjacent to State Street Brats, uh, for example. But that, 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 that has that entrances over. both on Francis and Lake, yeah. Yeah, it's a big one. Yeah. So we're working on it, and, and uh, but generally, the vast majority of alcohol license establishments downtown, of which, of course, there are there literally are scores of them, uh, cause absolutely no problems and are not. So, how was that received uh, by um, the the uh, members? The, that, the, the members? Uh, you know, I think that they themselves realize that there, there needs to be some some solutions to issues that they've seen. I don't think any of them, um, you know, enjoy also having see themselves being a center of attention of, of constant police calls and fights and really situations that have been um, extremely dangerous. So, um, you know, certainly they, like, like, like everything, you know, it's another hour of business, but we were not closing. They were just saying don't allow people to enter and re-enter. And I felt that, that uh, the establishments were, were very understanding and, and certainly are willing to partner with the city to try different Right, so this um, is a request, ways. not an order. Or it, it, it was a request at this point okay, that we, right. we asked them to kind of voluntarily agree to, and, and they did. Okay, good. So, so it, What's the it, it time period a, that's going to be looked at, studied, and report back to um, you? So, so I'll just mention as a follow-up to what Shiva just articulated that 
the, it was a request that was conveyed at the ALRC meeting that, that I think blindsided, frankly, some of the licensed establishments, <laughs> um, but, but they all agreed on the record to, to the condition that we then okay. ordered. So it was a condition to, so, of so, so it is an official oh, legal condition okay. of their license about the entry and no re-entry, that, that, so it is on each of those licenses okay. so so they could be prosecuted and this if they is the month of june where you're going through condition. all of that review do you have more to yes. go through it in fact on tonight's Tonight, city agenda. tonight's city council agenda the we the lion's share of all licenses were handled at the last council meeting two weeks ago uh, in fact it was a relatively short meeting but but Consent. the vast majority of everything yeah. on the agenda was were, were alcohol license related uh, and then there's a couple that will be on tonight's agenda. The and biggest one being is the, the sushi. right the the oh, the non renewal of a restaurant at, yeah. at State and Gilman Streets called Koi Sushi. Sushi, and their issue just quickly it, it is a um, significant building code violations are alleged illegal yeah. construction and expansion of their license premise. Yeah, that's too bad. Yes, you don't do those things. <laughs> so let's move on because we have limited time. Uh, other key issues. That, Yes, go ahead. Key issues in, my, in district? In yes, the district? Yes, okay. Yes, yes. So I'm like ready to talk about uh, traffic. I <laughs> so, <have that> <laughs> so, I mean, I would say, um, and many elders will say that to you, um, where we spend a great majority of our time is really trying to respond to concerns that we have from our residents um, in, you know, uh, about traffic, um, speeding. Um, not feeling that there is a good balance between um, bike, pedestrian, and, and cars. So I would say certainly from a District 5 perspective, you know, we're ha a dense residential neighborhood with a lot of young kids with two schools, Randall and, and West Higher in my district. And so this constant um, conflict between modes of transportation and um, commuter traffic um, and how to make... Um, you know, the neighborhood safe for all modes of, of transportation is really, I would say, a top topic um, in, in, for residents of District 5 that come up, come up Any resolutions on any particular congestion, congestion You know, areas? we've tried, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time trying to work on different pieces of, of um, these issues in, in my um, neighborhood. So we've done things from adding, you know, traffic, lights to continental uh, crossing to um, putting those uh, speed permanent speed readers, oh, readers. Um, okay. and, yep. and those are permanent for example we were the first district where we had those permanent speed readers in in madison so we have them by west high and randall um, to other uh, you know initiatives on, on the university avenue old mm -hmm. university avenue corridor um, when it was redone we tried to kind of improve the the lanes, et cetera. So there is a lot of work that's been done, but it continues to always be a constant struggle, I think, mm -hmm. to, um, we can't just eliminate all the cars. No, no. And the drivers. And, and as, <laughs> the popular, as he was saying, as more apartments get built, there's more traffic coming in and it just keeps going around. And on the agenda tonight, you have a, the approval of a new transportation director? We do. Okay, so, but we're, we're gonna get to some other issues. I'm just trying to have them you know, give them little bites that they might want to watch the rest of the, your uh, meeting tonight. Um, uh, well, traffic for you are street closures too, of all the festivals. Oh, oh and, yes. And, <laughs> and the buses being rerouted and everything yeah. else. I mean, yes. every, everything Shiva said, I think, is true of almost all mm -hmm. every city council district in the, mm -hmm. in the city. Uh, it's particularly compounded, of course, this time of the year with construction, and there seemingly is always massive street construction mm -hmm. in Madison, particularly impacting the downtown. Uh, by the way, a lot of the construction downtown is utility related, so it's not the city to be blamed, if you will. Oh, but so, for example, the West Washington Avenue um, construction is largely is in Madison Gas and Electric, but, but traffic concerns are obviously huge mm -hmm. um, throughout the city, including downtown, and it, particularly as it affects bicyclists and pedestrians, yes. and we try to improve. Yes, um, we want to our, encourage bicycle riding, and yet there's this, this friction between them. Mm -hmm. so. The one question I always ask, and we're limited on time, so I do want to get this in. Um, you're an older person for 23 years, and you've been an older person for nine years, nine years going on 10. Um, what makes you most proud to represent your district? What makes you, you so proud of your district that you live in? The people of my 
I do strict, I would okay. say. I mean, I, I feel like I have very engaged residents. We've been having um, a lot of conversation around issues of equity, um, and we are, you know, a very lucky um, group of residents of the city of Madison. We live in a very nice neighborhood. Um, so I, I think the level of engagement and, and how, how committed people are to the city um, is great. And then what makes me personally proud sure. is the park that sits right next to um, Randall School, which is Olive Jones Park. Mm -hmm. And that was one of my first projects as an alder, and it was a literally ugly park and in a you know sea of cement. And now it's this beautiful park where people just gather and get together, and it brings people from all different neighborhoods to District 5. And the kids at Randall just love it. Well, well, obviously, uh, it's a tremendous honor and privilege, and and I have a lot to be proud of over the you know couple decades I've been doing this, and and one of the things you I mean you're asking about differences between districts. Obviously, we're all very much involved in public service and find it very rewarding. That goes without saying, mm -hmm. but the fact that that the fourth district is so diverse, I wish it was more diverse in terms of the demographics but it's so diverse in terms of the issues that I deal with on a daily basis with so many businesses downtown. The fact that the region's tourism industry is headquartered in the downtown. You know, I, I uh, serve on both the Monona Terrace and Overture boards, for example, because they're such mm -hmm. key f um, you know, facilities uh, in, the, in the downtown. So it, it's the diversity of issues, the diversity of um, you know businesses, you know from the mom and pop small State Street retailer to you know dealing with you know major employers on the Capitol Square. It, it's something different all the time, and it really is truly really rewarding and an honor and privilege that I've I've been able to do this as long as I have. The, the lastly, I'll just say that one of the challenges is that the fourth district, like many of the campus area districts, is largely transient. So so many of the constituents that I have the pleasure of assisting of of getting to know over the years largely decide to move on many because they decide to raise a, a family and they just feel sadly that downtown isn't the place to raise uh, children as they get older even though we still have school bus routes and more and more kids that I see downtown waiting for the school buses in the morning uh, that's the one part of the downtown that the uh, demographics that we really don't have a lot of our, our school age kids yeah. All right. well, and I you know everybody I think over Time. This is the question I ask all the elders, and so I hear most of you saying the same thing over and over, and I can certainly relate because it was the people in the public service which drew, drew us to this. One item that I, I wanted to ask Mike to clarify for our viewers, and we have a half a minute, is the... Uh, the hard for me. I know, I it know would be very hard is, for but... you. It's about, about the Judge Doyle um, issue mm -hmm. and the lawsuit that's coming, and I know you can't talk about it, but let's explain the issue because it's confusing when they're talking about two stories and then a podium, which some have asked me, well, isn't the podium just a slab on top of the parking lot? So can you, well, in, in, 30 in a few seconds, seconds we have the, yeah. to explain the podium would be built atop the subterranean parking garage that the parking utility would be operating behind the Mass Municipal Building at, at right. Doty and Pinckney Streets. So the giant hole in the ground would be then topped off by a so-called podium well, of one, podium? yes, of, of the first floor of a bicycle center owned by the city, operated by a nonprofit, and retail space that we would lease out. And then two levels of underground, of above ground parking that would then serve whatever development is built above ground, and then a so-called transfer slab to allow for a building to someday to be built top. above it. Right. For your viewers, so for all, your, of that is the, all of that is, is called the podium. podium. And, and what's on our agenda for tonight's meeting is simply a resolution that I don't think will get much discussion, if any, to hire outside legal counsel that are experts in construction law to deal with the litigation that we're now involved right, in, unfortunately, right. by, by Beitler Real Estate. But just so. To, so people can understand, what is it that the city is buying? We're buying about two stories. Constructing. Two, well, could, what, uh, what we would be constructing, constructing would be our own process. city right. public works project. But right. then someday, hopefully, we would then sell it or lease it to a third party okay. who wouldn't have it for the long term. I have to cut. So we are beginning summer break. Don't forget to watch out for kids that are out from school and wearing their helmets, we hope, as they're riding their bikes. And don't forget to buckle up for safety. Thank you and good night. Mm -hmm.